So welcome to the first round table of the Liverpool Fashion Summit 2020. We got here an amazing panel. We got Isabella from the Vivian Westwood. She's Corporate Social Responsibility Coordinator. We got Hannah from Labour Behind the Label. She's Director of Advocacy. And we got Dr. Amy Benstead. She's researcher and lecturer at the University of Manchester. Um, well, it's, thank you so much for joining. That's the first thing. We're like really honored. And I speak on behalf of Oli too, uh, because it's great to have you all here. Uh, don't know if you wanna say hello, <laughs> introduce yourselves. Definitely, thank you for having me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with such a great panelist and um, we definitely can bring different perspective on the matter and hopefully have a very interesting conversation for, for all the guests here. Yeah, maybe I might just say a quick little bit about what Labour Behind the Label is and does. So we're an NGO um, based in the UK uh, who are part of the Clean Clothes Campaign, which is a global network of um, labour rights, um, NGOs, trade unions, um, activists, like, tra like human rights defenders on the ground in producer countries, um, who are all working together to try to improve conditions for garment workers in the global garment industry. Um, yes, fight for justice. <laughs> so we've been around since about 2002 uh, and we do, yeah, we do a lot of global work standing in solidarity with workers in supply chains. Um, uh, but yeah, actually also increasingly more work in the UK about the UK production and what's happening in factories here on the home soil. I'll quick say a quick hi as well. So um, yeah, I'm from the University of Manchester. Um, my background is actually working in the fashion industry. So I used to work on the sourcing and production side, sourcing for lots of the UK high street retailers. Um, and I was based out in Istanbul, so I've worked there for a few years, um, working with all the factories out there and got quite involved in the audit process as well. Um, and then I decided to move back to academia and my research focuses on modern slavery in particular. And really looking how to tackle um, slavery and work with companies and look at how they can collaborate and, and detect and remediate as well. If I can add a little bit more about me because I just said hi and uh, I'm working here at Vivian Westwood Italia so I'm here in Milano and there's a reason uh, why basically Vivian Westwood of course has its uh, creative mind and style uh, in UK, in London, but uh, the majority of our supply chain is here in Italy. So that is why during the, uh, over the course of the past years, the business unit here uh, really is in charge of the production coordination, uh, operation and supply chain. And having this kind of controlled unit near, close to the factories and suppliers really is crucial also to uh, guarantee visibility, transparency and all the, the, the actions against um, any kind of modern slavery. That's great, thank you. So as you can see, we got three different backgrounds uh, together. We got the corporate with Isabella, we got the NGO with Anna, and we got research with Amy. Um, what do you think that modern slavery could be like, clearly explain to someone that is not into um, more than this specific uh, area. Sorry. Isabella, maybe you want to start with the corporate. What's for Vivian Westwood, modern slavery? Yeah, I would say, of course, it's a term referring to all the, the crimes and, and um, practices that include uh, human trafficking, forced labor, debt bondage, um, and traditional slavery and so on, that can happen in, in our case, in the, the side of the supply chain that are not very clear of score, but actually can happen everywhere in our, in our business. So um, this is why we have to tackle it from different, different ways. And I can maybe speak a little bit more also about how can, it be target if cannot be uh, uh, sorry cannot be really um, contextualized. So 
for example, in Italy, of course, wine, uh, it's not very easy to talk about modern slavery because uh, we, we have kind of a legislation that really covers uh, strictly all the, the matters regarding the, the, the labor side of the, of the work. But again, it's very, very, very important also to, to talk about the definition with all the key actors of the supply chain in order to achieve any kind of results, I think. And it, this is a, a really also big, big uh, part of what we are working on. So about training and explaining, not just by, for creating awareness, but to work together to have an action plan uh, and to achieve results basically on a concrete level. Hannah, do you want to bring your views? Yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, classically, modern slavery, if you look at the UN definition, is more to do with like child labour or forced labour, probably for, for the garment industry. Um, but, you know, if you, if you kind of look at whether child labour is existing in a huge, big way in, across lots of factories, you know, it's, it, it's, in my experience, it's been broadly wiped out at tier one and, um, and that there's, it's not like the huge issue that everybody always likes to think that it is. Um, although it is still something that is happening like deeper down in supply chains um, with, you know, tier two and tier three. Um, and certainly I think it's happening um, kind of as an indirect result of exploitation that's happening in, in a general level uh, in um, like in factories in Bangladesh. For example, if you're a worker and you're being paid um, a third of the amount that you need to support your family, um, which is standard, then you're having to do extra hours to be able to look after your, your kids um, up to like 60 hours a week. And then, you know, even then you can't find the savings to be able to like cover all the costs for your family. So it's sometimes the case, um, and there's been quite a few studies that have shown this, that there's this um, transference costs where, you know, workers end up taking their children out of schools because they can't afford to pay small school fees and then children have to go into other smaller industries in Bangladesh like leather working or fisheries or domestic labor and you know so child labor does exist in supply chains kind of as a result of stuff that is happening at tier one in, in big factories but um but kind of classically like you, I, I don't I don't think you're going to go into many factories and be like oh look there's loads of children here um uh, at, the, at this point in time um, but yeah and forced labor uh, is again like one of those things where um, you know we do have cases that come up so maybe I might just say something quickly about another thing that the clean clothes campaign does we take up cases that are requested by people in the network so if there's a union in Thailand and a load of their union leaders have been fired they might say hey, we need some support on this. And then the Clean Clothes campaign will go to the brands that are involved in that factory and say, hey, there's something that's violating your supplier code of conduct. Can you deal with this? And we kind of try and act as a link. So yeah. we have cases that are quite current of things that are happening in the supply chain. So um, we've got a case that has been happening in, in Thailand that, um, yeah, it was about uh, workers who had been hired into a... Um, yeah, into like by labor agents into a factory situation and their passports taken away and then the, them not being allowed to leave the compound. Um, blah. Uh, so, the, so, you know, that kind of restriction of freedom of movement um, and workers being forced to take up certain hours, you know, can, like is found. But again, it's not like something that I'm like, oh yeah, that's all the time. We're always coming across that kind of stuff. But From time to time. Yeah, but you do find like, you know, excessive working hours all the time. <laughs> so, um, and that's and that's the kind of thing that is economically driven. That it's not like you say to the workers, um, you know, uh, well, you're free to choose. Like you're free to choose, but yeah. in you're actually not free to choose because if you're not being paid enough to be able to support your family, then what's the choice? <laughs> yeah, you have no other choice. So forced forced labour, again, is one of the kind of funny definitions of stuff. So um, I, what I would say is like, is, you know, is modern slavery like everywhere in supply chains? Um, if you look at the classic definition of it, like, like there are cases of it, obviously. Um, but if you look at exploitation, like broadly, then yeah, that is definitely happening across the board in loads of supply factories. And sometimes that exhibits as modern slavery. Yeah. Amy, you want to join? <laughs> yeah, I mean, those are some really good points. But um, I suppose, yeah, it's, it's just how it's everywhere and it happens, like Isabella and Anna said, it, 
anywhere within the supply chain you know it cannot even happen in a, a distribution center there's been um reports you know even in the uk where people have been trafficked into like a, a better life in england and then they're exploited in distribution centers and i think a lot of people are really surprised that it's happening you know it's a global issue and it's happening in the uk um mm -hmm. on our doorstep and you know there's obviously been the recent reports in leicester um, relating to, to Boohoo and I think that often shocks people because you can look at risk in different countries and we obviously think sometimes that UK is probably more stringent and there's regulations but you know it is happening on our doorstep as well so it's such a complex issue and it's a global issue and, and the fashion industry is so complex with overlapping supply chains and, and multi-tier multi supply chains which just makes it so much more difficult to to tackle and trade. Yeah, actually, one of the hot topics on on media on the media these days, I think, it's transparency. Like consumers are, are asking for more information, and as you said, Anna, not just first tier suppliers, but going deeper and second tier and third tier, because it's not that you're you're not um, accepting modern slavery, but what happens behind the scenes, it's also important. But how would you measure, let's say, how bad is modern slavery? Like, from your point of view, do you know, Anna, maybe you got, I mean, you've recently been involved in the Boohoo scandal. Yeah, I mean, it's difficult, difficult to say, like, how would you measure it? I don't know. I mean, I think any case of modern slavery is too many cases. And um, that's, so the fact that it exists is the thing that we have to, to, to stop, <laughs> right? Um, but yeah, I want to come back to my point, I guess, about exploitation more broadly. And actually, um, I'd probably like to argue that modern slavery is quite an um, unhelpful definition <laughs> of like of, of what is going wrong with the fashion industry because it 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 quite narrowly segments some problems as worse than others when actually there's this on um, influence of you know. Uh, exploitation leading to barriers to freedom of association, leading to, um, I don't know, poverty, leading to workers being trafficked into factories. You know, like all of those things are really interrelated and um, we need to kind of look at the source of how do we fix fashion um, around, I don't know, all of the actors in the supply chain and each of their different economic impacts and how, the, how then that could have a negative impact on workers. But yeah, I don't know. Maybe, I, I mean, I might say something just a little bit about Leicester. Um, yeah. because it's quite an interesting case study example um, of you know what's what's currently happening in in reshoring um, as with fashion and um, you know we, we it's Leicester's really interesting because it's so, so dense with loads of factories <laughs> and although it does exist across the rest of the UK this the, the the type of production that's happening when you go to Leicester you know there are thousands of factories all in this kind of one very small little area of the city um, and you know a lot of them are kind of all these units that are just 10 workers 15 workers and they kind of pop up and close down and pop up and close down and, they, and a lot of it is kind of um well, it's, it's producing really fast turnaround orders for a lot of e-commerce brands, mostly. And, you know, and the the, the, the um, uh, information that we've had back from people on the ground is that like eighty percent of the factories in in Leicester are producing something for Boohoo. So, <laughs> you know, that it's really, it, big it's amount. Really very controlled by one brand in lots of ways. Um, although that you know there are a lot of other UK brands that are wanting to do business there because it's a really like if we had a clean industry, it would be a really helpful, um, nice little top up space <laughs> to be able to you know to pick up a trend that's doing quite well and you can make some extra orders and you know ship it out quite quick and da -da -da. there's a lot of benefits to having production like right on your doorstep. So. Um, uh, yeah, but what we found during lockdown was, um, uh, that, I mean, sales for Boohoo went up quite a lot, <laughs> probably because a lot of people were sitting at home on their computers getting Facebook ads saying, hey, buy this. And they thought, oh, I'll just buy some new pajamas, you know, um, and that, that they did really well in, in the middle of COVID, whereas a lot of high street, other, other high street brands kind of plummeted. Um, and uh, the, the yeah, the orders continued to flood into Leicester, and um, there was 
there, there was a lot of pressure uh, anecdotally on, on the workers to continue working and you know with factory owners saying to them you are key workers you have to come in and make sure that you don't even if you're feeling ill don't stay at home um, and as a result Leicester is still, still in lockdown which I think says something um, but there was but um, yeah the, there was there were kind of lots of reports around you know furlough fraud where factory owners were taking the furlough costs but actually asking the workers to produce the orders um yeah of like pressurized working conditions where the factories open throughout the night uh and then you know like factories that hadn't socially distanced people working still in quite um limited tight spaces and then the illegal pay is a continuing issue which is something that's been um the case since well since really it was started to be uncovered in 2015 um that workers are paid three pound fifty an hour um as a standard as a Leicester Leicester standard you know and we again the, like the times um uh, investigation that happened during covid like found like five pounds an hour is like a maximum i think it was and so it was it, it really is still in that window that that workers are um you know having uh pay slips that show that they've worked 15 hours a week and no sorry 15 hours and then have been yeah actually working 40 hours but um are being paid yeah and, and show a legal wage but actually there's a double bookkeeping going on and uh yeah and workers are actually being paid like 350 so the, it, it's something i think that that um yeah has like it's the the way that economic economically the industry has responded to super cheap fashion it's like this in this whole setup has developed around there's somebody who wants to pay us like to do something really 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 cheaply very 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 fast and um that there's been you know there's factory owners who have said okay well we can do that if we don't pay people very much and we have like a slightly little dodgy yeah. bookkeeping thing on the side and we can manage that and manage that and cut those corners and do this and do this and gradually the whole of leicester is developed as this space that does that um yeah anyway. so if i can add yeah, if I can add, I think, uh, Julia, and stress the point of also of Anna, I think there are variables uh, very much linked to the, especially the fashion system, um, that really, I think, can emphasize how bad it can be uh, in, in this kind of supply chains. First of all, time constraints or time is in fact because uh, when you push too much the, the deliveries and you ask your suppliers to deliver your orders, then in the end, you are basically asking them to, to excessive hours of work and, and, and probably also working in, in conditions that are not the, the normal human condition that everyone should work in. And so time, of course, when you also associate the, 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 the word fashion, uh, fast, sorry, fast to fashion, basically you're, uh, you're giving a, a different meaning of what fashion should be. I mean, it, um, fashion and especially then also uh, higher brands, but uh, when you buy a product that should be good quality, to, to have quality, you should have also that time to provide that quality. And, and um, basically, um, also the, the, the fact that you're buying cheaper means that you are buying, basically, you uh, someone along the line is paying the cost you're not paying, basically. Yes. Uh, so th these, those are effects. And also the fact that the fashion industry is very much connected to labor intensity work. You know, you know, you have very beautiful dresses that are linked to embroidery and hours or maybe sewing and other phases of production. And that is really manual. So very much linked to, um, to, to activities that are not service providing, but are very, very much physical. So this is also another aspect of, you know, intensity of labor at conditions that could be also the delight or the, the, the environment or the, the, the threat of a boss not providing the dress in the, in the right time. And also the fact that maybe uh, also the, the suppliers and sub suppliers along the line are basically dependent on uh, the upstream of the supply chain. So raw material from spinning to ginners to farmers. And so you, you before you, you quoted the, the traceability and transparency. And I think that is basically the first step of solving any kind of vision because if you don't know then you basically cannot really do anything about it 
for from our side, uh, something interesting I could state is that we started last year uh, a pilot project with the United Nations, and they are the one that before fashion industry they focus on food and fishing especially, and they really wanted to set a guideline and standards on traceability and transparency and supply chain. So not definitely not just specific to mother slavery, but it's a very much important first step because then all the brands and all the fashion system will have a reference or a standard to follow. And this will also provide to consumers and final, uh, yeah, consumers, uh, basically a, an expectation of on what to ask for and what to expect. So I think that that is really interesting. And uh, I think in the, in the next year, the, the, the results will be shared uh, for all the, the members and uh, for the community. It's always good to have a guide, uh, especially for corporations, but also for customers to, to know what they need to ask for, why you're paying extra money for that garment. Because as you said, if you're paying little, it means someone is paying for that. Amy, don't know if you want to bring something to the table. Yeah, I mean, yeah? It, it all comes down to purchasing practices, really, and, and the, the current model that isn't working and, and someone is paying the price somewhere and it's, it's the workers. Um, because there's that real power imbalance and the retailers are very powerful and they're exerting like you said the time pressure price pressure onto the factories um so that you know the, the model really needs to to change um and it's not going to change if, if there's this constant demand for cheap fast fashion as well um so that, that the consumer side as well that needs to come into it um it's obviously a really complex issue in it can't be solved by just one company everyone needs to come together and i've been looking at how companies can collaborate as well and it really is about separating their commercial agenda to their their sustainability um kind of side of their business as well and their their, their compliance but at the same time if there's it's meaningless if you if the companies start um trying to be kind of more socially responsible but then they don't tackle their purchasing practices um because the, the two in the two go in hand in hand yeah uh, connecting that with what anna said before that it's really complex because it, it is spread across levels it goes to the customer it goes to the company suppliers governments and everyone needs to be part of it to to actually make a real change because as you said if a company is doing changes but nothing else around changes it's just not pointless but really hard to go against the stream can i just quickly pick up a point that somebody's yep. made in the chat which is about what's the role of government in tackling the abuses because i think this is relevant to like everybody needing to act together because um you know, there have been calls actually by Boohoo for, um, for factory uh, licensing in Leicester that, that, fact that the government would intervene, would, you know, check that a factory is okay and then give it a stamp and it'd be like, this factory is fine. And then, you know, we move on. Um, I, I, I think that there is a role for enforcement and I do want the government to get more involved in that kind of thing. But actually, I think you know, a, a, that being the only intervention could be really negative. <laughs> <laughs> um, because you know it what we don't want is for like once every two years somebody to show up with a clipboard the companies the factories to kind of clean up for a couple of weeks then get their stamp and then you know everything goes back to normal again a couple of weeks later and um, and then brands have got an excuse to just say oh that's it. you know everything's fine because this is a, a licensed factory um, so because so, because licensing I, um, uh, as a one-off approach doesn't work but I think it needs to be like a continual engagement from law enforcement where possible that if I mean the problem is that our labour inspectorate is hugely under-resourced and you know that there's they've only really done like 50 different inspections in the last I don't know the last few months and that's and you know we need we need thousands <laughs> there needs to be like engagement on a regular basis with the with with the factories and some could argue actually that that is the responsibility of brands more who've got the money and who are actually taking the who are taking some 
you know, some cut or some benefit, some value from the supply chain to be doing that. And so I think it needs to be the, that, that law enforcement works together with sharing information with brands and sharing information with um, unions and workers' rights groups and actually with local government and with um, communities who are able to, to help empower workers with information about their labor rights and like a whole load of stuff needs to come together to find a solution rather than it just being like a, a, a one-off approach. So. Maybe you feel like... Sorry, but also oh, say purchasing practices would be a huge part of that because that's really where this problem is coming from. It's like from those meetings where Boohoo gathers together 20 of their suppliers and says, who can make this for five pounds? Oh, actually, no, you can do it for four pounds. Okay, you take it. You know, like, and, and, uh, and, and that we're driving down prices. Uh, th that's how we end up with exploitation. Yeah. And, uh, well, I was going to ask Isabel, and maybe you can tell us if you, within Vivian Westwood, you collaborate with local governments to maybe like research and try to find ways to tackle these issues or to design policy because it's it's part of the changes communication between the parties um kind of i think uh we first of all are trying to set up a program that could bring systematic change but i agree with you that it is not rather just the single brand but at the same time the same factories maybe are not exclusive to our brand. So at the same time, we are trying to gathering, and you know, there are associations also in Italy dealing with fashion as a system. Uh, we are trying to push to push to work together also with uh, academic and university and other kind of entities here. Um, also to uh, speak up if there are any issue that can bring value to other suppliers or other brands so definitely we, we are trying at the same time i think um there should change uh, in my opinion also the perspective as uh, the brand um, starting this kind of program that could yes involve audits and visits and discussion with suppliers as a kind of a, a punishment because it's not like that uh, at all um for example we're trying of, to build kind of a uh, improvement program that really goes on um, well with the, the structure of the Water Slavery Act as well, uh, in the sense that there should be an, in, an improvement, a continuous improvement year by year. That's why there is a statement. I don't think there should be any kind of single report that really puts together some kind of, uh, you know, maybe action done uh, and then stops it. So if, if we want to bring change, I think we should work and that is why it's not a punishment because if something related could potentially very very far from this from the modern slavery issue but there is something we can work on with the supplier we should work together season by season to try to solve it and not just giving correction action plan to them and make them okay so if uh, in two months you're not done with this of course if we're talking of uh, no kind of notorial tolerance signals uh, but if there's something minimum minimal uh, if you want to build up a relationship that really lasts long and we want to help them really solve that i think the brand should also very much be involved with suppliers as well along the line so that is why i, I also was mentioning before the kind of a, a partnership in the sense that uh, it should be a, a work together getting uh, training collect, collecting issues but then be there, be present, and go there uh, and be face to face with your, not just your one suppliers. And that is, it is very much connected, if I can say this, um, to the fact that over the last, I think, six, seven years, uh, we changed completely our business model. So in order to uh, to be sure and to, 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 to really do something about this, this kind of, uh, this kind of issues, we really had to internalize very much all activities related to production. So it, you cannot work in license, you cannot demand to other to, to, to do some, some activities related to your brands. So uh, I would say that control, again, uh, I stress that, the control is very much uh, goes hand in hand with, with the traceability and creating partnership to solve this issue. And I think when one of the problems of communication within the parties it's always that 
it seems that the corporate world doesn't want to listen to research world and in the middle it's NGOs fighting oh this research is saying this why companies are not applying this there's this report there's this research and don't know Amy you got the background in academia have you like struggled to uh, push forward with their companies to listen to your research um, I mean, I think because of my backgrounds in industry, I've got some, had some really good experience working with companies as well. They've been quite receptive. Um, and I've did, my research has been what's called action research. So um, I've been working with companies to help them change. So I did a big project with one in particular um, where we looked at how they could respond to the modern slavery legislation. And we did a number of initiatives and um, developed training for them and went I went with them to a, a factory in a high risk area and we, we developed the de detection um, and remediation with the factory. So it's, it's been good to work with companies and um, I'm working with a UK based one at the moment as well and looking at what they can be doing um, to, to really make these necessary changes. But kind of echoing Isabella's points, it's really about being collaborative and developmental with, with suppliers and that's what I did with this company and in my research because the, the standard is to just you know give a corrective action plan and that they're, they're kind of just left to figure it out for themselves and I know from my experience of, in Turkey I did try and work with the uh, with the factories but it was very much like here's the, you get left with a list so we try to really form more of a working group to um to work through the issues and not you know not terminate relationships not um just say this is what needs to be done but you know try and ensure that the suppliers understand why as well and what needs doing and work with them um, and then the importance of, of the worker voice as well I know Anna touched on that as well but that's another area I've started to look at because you know they're the ones that it's their reality and that they know what the issues they're facing um, although sometimes they don't that's the other point so we need to really understand what's going on for them um, but then so that they are empowered and they understand what the issues are as well because sometimes actually when I, I've interviewed some workers they they've been open because they don't actually know that that shouldn't be happening and I think that's another issue as well and um, so we really need to hear from the workers and and to find out what's going on and, and improve things for them yeah I think uh, well I read an interview Easter Bella had a couple months ago and you you pointed out that fashion should be educating uh, brands have that responsibility of educating consumers but at the same time um, educating their internal uh, people their suppliers workers and everyone and in this education process i think uh, everyone is implied not only companies but also ngos like anna has that you need to let people know what are their rights of that they got at work because as Amy pointed many times workers think oh no this is what I have to do because it's normalized that I have to work 20 hours and I got four hours just to rest and feed my family uh, but in here what do you think it connects with Emma's uh, question Whose responsibility is it? Is it just the consumers? It's just the brands. Which is the role of the consumer in this um, issue of modern slavery? Whoever wants to start first. <laughs> Anna, maybe? Yeah, I could say about something about consumers. <laughs> um, you know, it, <laughs> it's the question that everybody always asks us with this, which is like, oh, where shall I shop? What shall I buy? How can I use, uh, how can I be a better consumer? Um, and I've kind of come around full circle on that question to like, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> buy what you're going to buy and get over it. <laughs> um, but I know, okay, so the, what I think about it is our role as a consumer um, is, is really complicated in fashion in a way that it's different from bananas or from um, uh, like, you know, fetching coffee, where there's a, a much more direct supply chain, which is to do with like, one consumer sorry one one company one farmer and then you can track you can give the money to them and then that 
you know, the fair trade premium gets done and whatever. Um, but actually fashion is, you know, multi-tiered and, you know, we've, we've as, as was mentioned before, that upstream of, I mean, I, we've been talking about um, cut, make and trim production, but, you know, there's, there's cotton farmers and there's ginning and weaving and spinning and dyeing and, 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 and then embroidery and, uh, and, and transport and then retail and then, and then second tier use and, you know, like fashion supply chains are hugely complex. And as a consumer, often like you get bamboozled with standards about like, okay, your action that you take could support a business that helps this small part of the supply chain or this small part of the supply chain or this small thing. And actually it's too much. It's too much to ask a consumer to use their buying power, which to be honest is fairly like a drop in the ocean um, to change the world. And actually that our power um, within the supply chain as, as shoppers is not to be um, economic units, is not to be the people who, you know, choose to give us a few small pence to somebody else or someone else or someone else. Um, it's to be involved in calling for change. It's to be involved in being voices. It's to be citizens and, um, and, and, and activists. <laughs> I mean, I would say that because I'm an activist, but I do genuinely think that, um, that, that our power is bigger to be someone who says on the internet, actually, this has to stop, or I, I oppose this, or I want to, I want to be part of the change. Um, and, you know, people can do that in small ways and in big ways. Uh, but yeah, I, I think where we shop is kind of neither here nor there. And so actually, I think the, the power to change needs to lie um, in the collaboration between brands and, um, and, and, and government and, and workers and, and the supply chain discussion rather than necessarily with consumers. Yeah. Wow, well, your views, Isabella. <laughs> Yeah, no, no, I, I carefully, I was carefully listening. Uh, at the same time, I think though, in the end, uh, if the consumer doesn't really choose consciously, and uh, that, that would mean that they are not really aware of some issues. I mean, if they continue to know and go to certain brands that maybe have already publicly some kind of certain issues, then they're saying, okay, it's not important that you're sold them or not. We are constantly just buying. So I think, I don't know, in, uh, in some ways, I, I, I would expect also kind of a rebellion, as you were was saying, uh, maybe in social media, maybe asking directly to the brand, or there are campaigns who made your clothes. But to in order to ask that, ty that type of question, I think you should really be mindful, study, be, be into those these panels, conversation, really inform yourself. Because at the end, uh, it, it, it's, uh, each one of us, also the consumer is part of the supply chain is it at the end. So there is also a role to them. I don't think it's just them, but I, I think they are a big, big part because then they're the ones pushing the, those questions to the board meetings of brands. And so the change I think will really be accelerated, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, I would argue everyone's got a part to play. Um, I, I know that for real change, yes, it's got to be changing business model, purchasing practices, listening to the worker, everything that we've said. Um, but, you know, there's more information, there's more than ever, you know, available now when it comes to what brands are doing and what they're reporting. And, and there's, there is this drive for them to be more transparent. So I do think that consumers need to be a lot more inquisitive and and like Isabella said, study the information that's out there um, and ask questions and, and be more of a, an activist. I mean, but in which case, I mean, we need to give better information to consumers. I mean, the problem is that, you know, I mean, we're, we're still fighting on the level of who has published their supply chain and many brands haven't. Um, including Vivian Westwood, um, but like, you know, the, 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 the brands just getting information out there about like who the, what the names of suppliers are doesn't help anything really in terms of like for a, from a consumer perspective, you look at that and go, um, oh, well, okay, what, what, how does that help my, my, my activism or how does that help my choice? So it, but it's, it's really difficult to work out like, you know, you can't, also produce rankings saying this brand is better than that brand when everybody's sharing all the same factories and there is a, jo a lot of joint you know j joint production so um yeah it's a really complicated problem i think to try and help consumers be able to make informed choices and yeah i think people should read stuff and get involved in the debate and be active and i think that's part of what being a informed citizen is 
um, but actually being able to make buying choices based on that is really is difficult. I, I, um, yeah, I, I mean, just to say that, you know, I would, uh, <laughs> I, I know who I won't buy from, <laughs> but then also, you know, you, and I think most people should look into that and know who they shouldn't buy from, but um, it is really, really difficult to try and then separate who you should buy from, in my opinion. And, well, we spoke about these previously. Uh, we said that social media has like opened this Pandora box, let's say. Everyone has access to loads of information, but not all, not all of it, it's true. Because what we're saying, there's, there's many sources generating information about the fashion industry, the brands. And we've seen with Boohoo, but also with the pay up movement, and with um, the misguided documentary series that is in, on, I think, Channel 4, that everyone wants to be part of this conversation and say, oh, I'm not supporting this, or I'm going to try to buy somewhere else. But what do you think the real problem for consumers that are overwhelmed with all this information, how can they consider this the issue that is now seen that happened in UK is not far it's not that happened in Bangladesh it's happening in UK how can they make those choices to as you said Anna it's really hard for them to choose but is there any way they can actually like say okay I'm improving my um, consumption behaviors because I'm trying to be wiser or more conscious to know if that makes sense. <laughs> With this sea or ocean of information, do you think there's a way that consumers can get more involved or start to become more activists? Yeah, I mean... Because <laughs> uh, not everyone knows about labor behind the label or yeah. about other NGOs, the Clean Clothes campaign or the, the fashion revolution. There's loads of people, but not the vast majority, not the mainstream. Yeah. So how can someone start and say, okay, let's go for it. I'm going to improve my... I mean, yeah, I think the, the starting point is signing up and getting involved you know like <laughs> put your name down and join a campaign or start reading the insta feed of like a bunch of different of these movements and then find out some stuff i yeah and um yeah and, and i mean i think there is something really important about people as a whole taking responsibility for thinking about what it is that they wear and just trying to connect with it on a human level on an everyday basis and thinking okay am i gonna um, just buy loads and loads and loads of new clothes or just slow down my engagement with fashion and think about you know buying a few good things that make me feel great that um you know that I, I want to wear and I want to last and um yeah and I know taking time to create what fashion is and how that makes you feel great you know like fashion is a beautiful and wonderful thing it's like how we are able to project ourselves on the outside world and you know it's it's a it's a it's an exploration and it's really it's really good <laughs> um and i want it to be better i want it to be like a place that people enjoy being in and a place that people um you know don't go into a shopping center and feel really crap about themselves <laughs> um or uh, you know or, or have like real dilemmas in the middle of a shopping center and think oh how can i stop sweatshops with my two pounds you know like I, th I think fashion should be a creative and brilliant space um, and I think it's possible but I think yeah I think people have to have to engage with it consciously and don't know Amy Isabella do you want to add something like how can consumers engage with those practices maybe the role of um, big fashion brands like yours Isabella how can a company say okay let's try to push uh, for the better consumption habit without greenwashing because it's one of that's that's the issue that when companies try to look like the good ones usually it's greenwashing what they are doing all right i, I think um again i don't think i don't see any brands at the finish line of 
basically checking all the issues and all the all the boxes it's a it's a journey for everyone and i think it's a, also a, a learning experience to get better no one is perfect and if it, there was if there were uh it, sorry if there was a, a a simple easy solution straightforward solution we, we've already done it i think um it, it's again i think be uh engaging with the brand in our cases i think the power of uh including the message in our clothes is a way to help the consumer to really uh, wear the, 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 that, that piece of clothing because they believe in a kind of message. If you wear something with stop climate change, you have to be involved. You have to educate yourself and 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 be really re, uh, to to be really uh, in, in line with the with the kind of concept you represent. So again. Um, and the same thing is for our, for example, fashion shows and collection in the past. Every every season there was a message to the public because we consider very much important the, the role of the consumer. And yeah, maybe you, you already know the quote, buy less, choose well, make it last, but we really believe in it. We uh, are doing the same action internally, buy less, we are producing less, we are cutting the cut, not in terms of quantity, not just in, and I'm not referring to eliminating orders at all, and in, in the sense that uh, we're trying to provide some balance so that uh, the, the, the consumer does not have to, to, to have compulsive buying uh, if they have that piece that really loves and can wear multiple seasons because it lasts, actually lasts, because there is quality. Again, if you are asking yourself how to spend that two pound you have, Maybe it's not a matter of quality, and maybe it's not the better choice you, you can you can make. So this, I think, it's a matter of choices. Again, uh, even if it's not easy, but it's still the, the first step of a learned journey. Well, there's great questions here. Emma is asking, like, what is your view on fashion round uh, table transparency index and the apps such as Good on You? Uh, can consumer trust them and can they be misleading? I, th I think um, I'll, I'll take that one first, but I think Anna's touched on this, but there is obviously a lot of information out there now and it does get quite confusing. Um, but I suppose being informed is helping. So if you can, if consumers can at least read around and there's no perfect answer to thing. I don't think there is going to be ever one like universal index or something. But if you can, you know, compare and, and see what's out there. And I think it's all raising awareness as well, which is can only be a good thing in, in some respects. Um, when we think about the ethical side, I think there is often that disconnect where people don't necessarily think about the people that make their clothes. I think it's sometimes easier to think about the environmental side and we're more aware about like documentaries that are on TV and seeing the oceans and climate change and everything, but we often forget about the people. And I think some of the recent, um, you know, news stories surrounding people because of the pandemic and people losing their jobs has probably caused more awareness about what's happening um, because of border cancellations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think it, it can only help in some respects for just consumers being more aware about the impact that low cost fast fashion can have on, on people and then people are paying the price and it's not just fast fashion I should you know luxury as well everyone all brands are actually impacting yeah, with their choices and, and people are suffering at the end of the day. You want to add something Anna? <laughs> Yeah, I, um, maybe I'll say something about Fashion Revolution. Um, I mean, I, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I really appreciate the work that they do. Um, I think that their, their activity is mostly geared to trying to get people to shop in a different way. And I, as I've already said, don't think that that's the solution, but blah. Um, they're, they're, they're like, yeah, they're fast, the Transparency Index, um, I think is really helpful in that it looks across a whole load of different categories and tries to pull together data um, which is quite complex on on a bunch of different brands so that's good um, but yeah it does look just at transparency and how transparent a brand is and, and that isn't 
the whole picture is it that isn't the whole solution i mean you can be a brand that screws down their suppliers on price like repeatedly every day and um, but publish you know and these are the names of those suppliers that i am continually exploiting and then um, and you know and then they would get like a big nice big green tick so you i, I guess um it depends what information you're trying to get <laughs> which again is this is this compute this confusion for consumers that um uh what what consumers want is somebody to say on all the different categories um everything in balance this is the best one <laughs> and actually that that information is impossible and not 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 good either like you know it, there's always going to be a spin on whatever information that you're producing um and and you know you take an angle on it and so the yeah the transparency index looks um at what information is in the public sphere and i think it's done a really good job at trying to kind of push forward um uh yeah the 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 general debate with a with a bunch of brands about about how we should be no, like as the UN guiding principles on business and human rights say about we should know and show what's happening in our supply chain and so getting brands to put out their information that says look we we are monitoring and um, ensuring that we're you know we've got visibility over our supply chain and this is it <laughs> and so telling consumers that this is what we've done um, uh, so yeah that visibility not just being like a thing that they've got internally but a thing that is out there so and that that is really important um, but, yeah, I think it also like, connects with what Isabella was saying, this journey of improving practices, of course, I mean, it could be done, but probably wouldn't be, it would be a mess, like if they change everything right now, but starting by being transparent, it's good that um, fashion brands engage with transparency and start publishing information. Of yeah. course, maybe in 10 years time, we'll be at a different position, hopefully better. Uh, we'll know more about what happens behind the scenes and yeah. what it's actually being done uh, yeah. to, to get a t-shirt placed in the shop and then in your wardrobe yeah i mean when i first joined labor behind the label you know we were lobbying brands to have a code of conduct i mean it was like <laughs> that a brand should be checking their factories against you know against ilo standards and that is now like <laughs> you know like two decades in the past which is Thank thankfully we've moved on and so now the debate that we're having about transparency i'm hoping is going to be old history pretty soon and we're going to be discussing um you know how how do we actually ensure that a living wage gets into a worker's pocket in five years time but who knows <laughs> i don't know where, where we're going next so oh hopefully yeah <laughs> and angela is asking do you think consumer pressure and public consciousness has a role to play in bringing change at board level more shareholders, investors, asking questions and raising concerns? I'm, in my opinion, definitely. Definitely in the sense that um, that feedback coming from consumers uh, really pushes the, the company to, to act a different way or provide some kind of, some, some kind of responses. So, so uh, it, it doesn't come unheard, definitely not. Uh, at the same time, um, I think probably there should be a, a, a way, but we were mentioning it before, to really uh, gather the kind of uh, the kind of questions um, in order to then provide feedback um, on, on on targeting consumer targeting consumer responses. So um, on a more holistic base, so not just one transparency index, but on a, on a more complex and holistic uh, way of communicating to, to consumer. That, that should be, I think, a, a final goal to make it a little bit more clear. But then again, I think the intervention of some entities above the brands uh, can really help with that to coordinate the kind of information that goes out and not just is fragmented to uh, on different platforms or on or different channels of communication should be a really maybe a, a one way uh, of reporting that could be more comparable to the consumer hopefully soon amy do you want to add something i think the others have said like quite good points there <laughs> um, but yeah i think as shareholders and investors have obviously got we've seen you know like boohoo's share price was impacted um, and it's fluctuating so i mean the ideal would be that that would really impact um 
change, but you know, time will tell, won't it? And we'll see what happens with uh but everyone needs to put pressure on. So if, if investors can put pressure on as well, that's surely going to have a, a positive impact. To say something about Boo share price, I think um, it was interesting that around that time, uh, ASOS pulled Boohoo products from their platform, and um, and there was a there was a big there's a big thing about like other um, retail uh, companies then trying to hold other companies to account for uh, for for what's happening in their supply chain. And so, is there a role of company to company yeah. to try and say actually, you know, we've there's been these these accounts of exploitation and we don't want to be associated with that so you can't retail via our, our e-commerce and so um zalando also have done something in the last in the last few weeks haven't they saying that they would only stock um brands that are meeting certain criteria on the hig index which i'm just i'm not particularly supportive of but whatever um you know but they're also trying to set like some criteria for like you know, for, for these, these, this is what you have to do to retail on our platform. And so there's, yeah, there's, there's definitely something in this about like how, um, yeah, how money can be, or to, well, how, how other brands can engage with trying to lift the whole industry by saying, this is actually, we have to set our own standards and we're going to, we're going to work together to try and have a, have a baseline. Yeah. That's the only way there really will be industry change because if there's always, you know, a bad egg or one that's not doing, you know, the right thing then it's not going to change so i mean i think all the brands are really enjoying though at all having a go at boohoo because <laughs> it's nice to have like a common enemy and everyone's just like oh well they're the baddies and we're the good ones but yeah. you know um it's yeah it's it's the start isn't it it's good. yeah and no one's perfect and i think they all need to accept the the flaws in their in their supply chain and that's the only way it'll change as well you've got to if you don't look for things like exploitation modern slavery then you know how are you going to solve them so you always have to accept it and, and look for it and then tackle issues and let's uh check the last question uh holy road it's about creativity which is also an important part of fashion so it's self-expression and she is asking how can brands incorporate the element of fun and emotive responses to clothes into the way they influence consumers and she also mentions that uh, we don't shop to have a complex ethical dilemma we go shop uh, to shop for fun and self-expression what what do you think about it yeah i mean i uh i think i think also that the the activity of shopping can be fun <laughs> although i don't personally find it fun i think um the idea of like uh, yeah of like swapping or um yeah or of altering or like get, meeting up to yeah to to work out how to like yeah how to combine garments or do different things you know like I kind of love all that stuff and I um I would like to see there be more kind of yeah reuse built into how different brands yeah um encourage consumers to engage with fashion really uh, and I, I think that probably is starting to come actually I think that there is some discussion with brands talking about whether they can do I don't know swapping in returns not for fast fashion but for high end for a little bit of higher end i think could be really interesting but and and um, yeah and as i said i don't know I, I i i like the idea that fashion should be a celebration and i i want that to be something that is that is built into the way that we see the future of the industry so yeah i i, I don't know how brands are going to do it but you know that's up to them <laughs> to, to add on this because um like i moved to uk seven years ago now and the first thing that struck me i remember i couldn't believe it and then consumption fashion consumption i used to work on a high street retailer and fashion consumption was like leisure i mean i was amazed because it's beautiful the landscapes you can find in in the uk you got the mountains you go you got the seaside it's beautiful but hardly ever you see people there just <laughs> tiny people, amounts of people and then you go to a shopping center and it's crowded like it, it, it's packed you can't fit in there like it's um, Christmas season it's even madness it's even worse so it's really hard to I think now that fight to okay that was our past let's say those consumption behaviors and 
the impulse shopping and try to move towards more sustainable consumption and say, okay, I'm going to enjoy the shopping experience, but just as a one thing, not a regular thing that repeats every day because, well, sh shops are open until late in Liverpool. I live in Chester, so shops close at five. Uh, <laughs> it's beautiful. You can enjoy life after that. So <laughs> do you think that change has also to be pushed from the company's like so let's say let's try to enjoy this shopping experience be creative express yourself but more consciously of that process yeah i think absolutely but also for example um we for years encourage the the diy so the, the do it yourself in the sense that uh the, cre the creativity of a fashion brand, then it really can be reflected multiple ways. If you have uh, a very, very good looking piece of years ago and you want to ex extend the life, there are ways to do it. And for example, we have styles that you can basically uh, change and alter very simply and, and wear for different occasions. But this is a kind of a, I think a mindset, as you were saying, is a very much linked to, the, to our lifestyle. And I remember being, yeah, relative uh, in my uh, 20s now, um, I, I remember years ago and going shopping was my outlet for stress. And I, I, I know many teenagers, my, myself as well. So uh, I, I think then if you start uh, having different passions and get involved, as Anna was mentioning before, get involved in, in campaigns. I put your name out there, maybe start learning something new. Then you can, I think, um, uh, use that ta the time for a more quality time or at the same time uh, change the way you experience shopping that shouldn't be compulsive shouldn't be unhealthy shouldn't be really focused on solving problems that cannot really be solved via shopping i would say and angela is pointing out uh, good point holly i wonder if humanizing garment has a role to play have sometimes bought something and there has been a photo name of the person that made it. It gives me a sense of human connection and gives you more of a desire to hold on to it and not take it for granted. And well, as a closing point, I think this that happened in Boohoo uh, will make British consumers more aware. I uh, don't know what your views are, but because it happened so close to our homes, it's, uh, it's like a neighbor suffered from modern slavery. Do you think we'll, we will get more emotionally connected now to these things that are happening behind the scenes? I think that would be the, the ideal. Um, I mean, it's touching on um, the point there that was it hot? Uh, with Angela made about the personal, yeah, the photo and the name. Because I've been buying quite a lot from independent brands or um, social enterprises, and you do often get like a card with information about who's made it or the owner. And I do think that is a nice touch, and it does make you connect more. But not everyone is maybe in a position to buy from those brands. Sometimes they're more expensive. Um, I don't know whether we'll see that, you know, on a, on a large scale happening. Um, and I think a lot of consumers, yeah, we'd, we'd like to think that because of the beauty scandal that everyone is more aware, but a lot of people are still buying from them and, and aren't that bothered. Um, I know even like when I teach my students, they are more inquisitive and more aware, but at the same time, I'm sure some of them are, are a real fan of the brands as well. And I think there's that disconnect, isn't it? Like people think, oh yes, it's terrible. And they do connect in one sense, but they still love the brand. Um, so yeah, it's, it, it's tricky, I think. What do you think, Anna? Yeah, I mean, um, I'd, like, I'd like us to see, you know how the kind of the slow food movement um, has, has connected more with consumers knowing who the farmer is and knowing where our food comes from and blah, blah, blah. Um, the, the, I mean, we don't have enough visibility for makers, I think, in the UK. 
Um, and you, you know, like back in the day when you, when you, there was a tailor down the road who worked in the factory and you know, you, your auntie knew somebody who knew the person from the factory, probably there was a lot more awareness about the value and the time and the beauty that went into the trade. Like how, how, how much, how much it takes, how much skill there is in, uh, in just in any piece of clothing, you know, as soon as you start to try and make something, you go, oh my gosh wow, <laughs> this uh, is not seven pounds worth of my time. This is like at least 50. <laughs> um, and, I, and I think there's, there's a problem that, that consumers don't understand the value of clothing. Um, and I'd really like to see that somehow shift so that people could connect more with makers and understand like what, 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 what yeah, like quality is. And then, um, yeah, I guess like it, then it's it's like how do you upscale that, and how would you make like a an actual connection between people who are buying? I mean, because we label behind the label exists to try and do something about big fashion, like the high street and what is happening systematically, rather necessarily than just like small maker by small maker, because that's that's really great, but we need to change the system. <laughs> um, and I, you know, that there, I mean, there have been some brands who have started to do some of that sort of traceability garment by garment. Like Inditex have got some Brazil line, I think, where they've got like a, um, a QR code that you can you can go through on e in each of the labels and then it takes you to some information about the supplier. Um, uh, yeah, and that kind of stuff could go further. Um, but it, I mean, on a huge scale, it'd be really difficult to do, I think, um, like to, uh, you know, to, to give visibility to a worker um, would, would be really tough. Um, but yeah, I don't know, Clean Clothes Campaign started looking a while ago into sort of apps and whether we whether worker information could contribute to fact like um supplier list information so if as brands like disclose supplier lists then workers at those factories could engage with them and give data that would be about it and then consumers could link into um you know any information that the workers have said about what's happened in that factory would be you could then link to a brand but it, that kind of stuff is still quite early days big data processing so and well, Emma and Holly were mentioning like the difference between uh, consumerism and fashion and what, because I think when something goes mainstream, it becomes like a kind of madness around. So you, maybe you can start shopping fashion on like a healthy uh, way, let's say, and then become an issue. But do you think like that, separation should be made so fashion and consumption in <laughs> let me read out loud <laughs> because you Good point. <laughs> so uh where is that here um i'd like to see more separation between fashion and shopping consumerism i don't think they are exactly the same thing fashion is about self-expression and creativity consumerism is about buying stuff speaking as a, as a consumer as well as a designer so do you think right now society is at that point that can separate fashion from consumption like crazy consum crazy consumption consumerism we hope so. We, we, we were trying to, to say, to, to convey this message, message for a long time. Uh, but at the same time, uh, I imagine that fashion again and, uh, and quality, I mean, yeah, if we consider fashion as the, the, um, the circle of the kind of craftsmanship, artisanal work, quality, time spending in making the, the kind of garment uh, in this kind of way, then, then yes, definitely it's, uh, it really has some values and some kind of um, uh, dream attached to, to it that it's so beautiful and, uh, and really should be pushed on the emotional level. I, I think consumerism, it should definitely be separated, but at the same time, I don't think in society, I don't see this differentiation in society right now so that this is why uh, we were talking about about the model of shopping because then if you have to if, if you feel like you have to buy something to feel better that's the problem i think anna amy you would you like to add something to that 
Yeah, to be honest, my research doesn't focus on the consumer side, so I, I would, I can't like really, if I'm just being honest, like I'm, I'm more, well, my, these are more my opinions on the consumer, because I think they are probably like intertwined, um, but I tend to focus more on the supply side, so it would just be my opinion that I, I think it's difficult to separate the two, actually. Well, we run out of time. I've just checked, it's 10 past. I would like to thank you so much, Isabella, Anna, and Amy. It's been great. It's my first round table. I hope it wasn't that bad, uh, <laughs> uh, but great. Thank you so much, all of you the, that came and joined us on the first day. Hope you come for the next round table tomorrow. We're having great speakers too, and the big day, it's Friday too. With the closing and we will be announcing the sustainable fund uh, winners and also if you check on our social media we're trying to raise funds for Oxfam and um, coronavirus a coronavirus appeal to support Bangladesh because as we all know and we've been talking about it's one of the main suppliers of our clothing industry uh, hope to see you tomorrow and thank you again <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's really good. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Bye.